1937 flood ended a string of peculiar weather phenomena in Evansville, Indiana. The winter of 1936 saw an ice gorge form, freezing the Ohio River for over two weeks. That summer was the hottest on record, seeing eight straight days when the temperature exceeded 100 degrees. As January of 1937 progressed, the odd weather patterns continued and resulted in the most dramatic flood Evansville has ever experienced. The power of man is growing, his wisdom great we know. But when the flood crept on us, it swept things to and fro. Voices cried aloud with fear, throngs trembled with despair. Never had they seen such woe, such sorrow everywhere. On January 9th, Evansville was experiencing unseasonably warm temperatures. That day, the warm 62 degree high dropped quickly to a frigid 40 degrees. On this day, the river also began to rise, elevating the water level to its 35 foot flood stage, causing water to flow into low lying areas. The cold temperatures resulted in a half inch coating of ice over the region, which melted over the following days. This excess ice melt began to flow into streams throughout the area, causing these streams to rise all over the bottomlands. The high water came, seemed to come up every spring, but this came early and never stopped. It just went on and on. In the following days, at least 10 other roads, including many highways coming out of Evansville, were also shut down. Citizens of Evansville began to grow alarmed. The true perspective of the flood can only be understood by those who saw it firsthand. One of those people was Ida Coker. Throughout the duration of the flood, she wrote letters to family in Mississippi detailing what was happening to Evansville, as well as the emotional impact of the flood. This flood business is getting me. I've taken bromides and still can't do anything but cook a very little and wash dishes. On January 16th, the river rose one and one-tenth feet in a 24-hour time period. The next day, it swelled another foot, reaching a 42 and 8 tenths foot stage. It was predicted that the river stage would rise to 45 feet, a height that had not been reached since 1933. As the flooding progressed, three disaster relief directors from the national headquarters of the Red Cross were ordered to Evansville. Coast Guard cutters were also requested to aid in the flood relief. Several hundred families were moved to higher ground as the water continued to rise. Nearly three inches of rain fell on January 21st, causing an even greater inundation of the city. The flood was beginning to gain national attention. The radio proclaimed the day and even night as well. They told of loss and suffering, which nothing else could tell. But listening to such perils was nerve strain, all confessed. It put us on our knees in prayer. It gave us earthly test. The radio is running all the time, giving Red Cross bulletins and appeals for help. McLean Collum, the weatherman, died at his desk this morning. He has had no rest. He was an old man and could not stand the strain. This was a mistake. He was 56. The Red Cross launched a massive campaign to generate $2 million for disaster relief, and the country responded generously. Motor-powered boats were sent in from larger cities such as Chicago and Buffalo, New York. The flood stage now reached over 48 feet, rising above the levels of the 1913 flood, and the river was predicted to continue to rise until it reached 50 feet. The Coast Guard responded to the call for cutters, sending in boats as railroad traffic and the bus and streetcar services were cut off. Bridges all over the city were closed. Only the Maryland Street Bridge remained to reach the west side of the city. By January 23rd, at least 400 families found themselves homeless. Disaster relief centers were set up throughout Evansville to provide food and shelter for those who were forced to leave their homes. The churches all took in refugees. Red Cross came, cooked in quantity. Um, they all, in the Methodist Church, where I belong, um, there was a uh, gymnasium, which was kind of halfway below ground. Well, at first, they set up all the cots in that gymnasium. Then darned if the water didn't come in there, and they had to evacuate the, uh, the rescue center. I don't know when you will get this letter, but I will send it when I can. Joe does not think he will work anymore probably this month. We finally turned off the radio. I am so nervous, I can hardly be quiet. Just one distress call after the other. Over 10 square miles of the city were now flooded. Farmers were forced to move their animals to higher ground to prevent them from going under with the flood. But many of the panicked animals still drowned. It was hard on pets. They couldn't get out. And a dog, big dog, took it upon himself to crawl up in our backyard and die. <laughs> And there, he was a great big fella, and uh, <laughs> there was nothing to do. They nobody would come and get him. So I remember my father dug, and that ground was hard, frozen. 
dug a, a grave for that animal. My father smoked cigars. <laughs> I can still see him puffing away on that cigar as he buried the dog. The weight of the water caused two huge cracks to form in the new million dollar riverfront plaza. The flood stage was predicted to rise between 54 and 55 feet, and the river only continued to rise. Due to the severity of the situation, Governor Clifford Townsend declared that Evansville and the surrounding areas were to be placed under martial law. They are reading the governor's proclamation, proclaiming martial law, and are giving rules. All sightseers must stay at home. Those who have left their homes cannot go back. All unnecessary motor traffic suspended. All filling stations are not allowed to fill pleasure cars. All school closed. Gasoline allowed for necessary cars only. There is nothing else to do. We are under military rule, and they can take anything you have if needed. All schools, churches, and businesses that were not directly contributing to the relief effort were shut down. The flooded areas were also restricted to any person, car, or boat without a military pass. Parts of Evansville had never been closed were closed. The Ingleside uh, area down there was deep under before it was all through. You could only see the rooftops. Our factory's whistles ceased their call for employment at this time, but called their men as volunteers with these words, fall in line. We'll give our best in every way, our halls for recreation. We'll use our home for refugees until rehabilitation. A martial law protected us, t'was needed and t'was best, to test us in our laws of state and keep our minds at rest. The Red Cross volunteered and gave its best both night and day giving life's necessities to those who could not pay. On January 25th, the water level began to increase at a rate of over an inch each hour, and it was predicted that the river would crest on the 29th, reaching 53 and a half feet. By the 28th, weather officials promised that the crest would be reached within 24 hours. The situation grew more desperate as all gas to the west side had to be cut off. The river did not reach its crest until January 31st, when it rose to its final 53 and 3 fourths foot height. We know now where 53 and 7 tenths feet of water will go. At our place, we could stand about 55 feet. Now, where I lived, um, there was water in the streets, but that came up through the sewers. We had to leave our house because there was so much water in the yard, it caved in our basement wall and put the fire out. And my aunt lived a block away, so we just went over and refugeed at their, her house. The river crest remained for three days, and did not begin to go down until Tuesday, February 2nd. By the 4th, martial law was lifted in all areas except for those that were still flooded. However, the military was still in control of the proceedings at the courthouse. As the water began to recede, the damage to the city became visible. Several buildings collapsed, and many small houses and barns were washed away. The Indiana Bell Telephone Company had to repair over 3,000 telephones in the area. As the murky waters of the Ohio ebbed, they left behind massive quantities of thin, silt-like mud. This mud covered everything that the flood had touched and became like concrete when it dried. It was nearly impossible to clean, and the height of the flood water was clearly marked by the line of mud on the sides of buildings and on their interior walls. I can see that oozy mud, brown, and it clung to everything. You could see that on the trunks of the trees, every, on the sides of the houses. By February 7th, the river finally receded past the 50-foot mark. Damage to the riverfront plaza was not as severe as originally predicted. Only $5,000 in repairs were needed. It was estimated that 10,000 homes in the Evansville area had been flooded with average damage to each, reaching $1,000, which totaled $10 million for residential repairs alone. It was estimated that repairs to city pavement would cost half a million dollars. Martial law in all areas was officially brought to an end by Governor Townsend at 12 o'clock on February 13th. It was now expected that the Red Cross would be able to give 4,500 families $350,000 worth of aid. The public schools in Evansville also suffered much damage. Students were not able to return to classes until February 17th after many delays for cleaning and repairs, which cost approximately $122,000. There were several small groceries out there. We didn't have any supermarkets in those days. We didn't, to me, it was a grand lark. No school, everybody out, the weather was nice, it was cold, but it was pretty. So the flood has left its marks behind, we never can forget. All so plain our eyes can view, it has left us all in debt. But with these losses may we be content our lives were spared, satisfied to see God's power, glad our best we shared. 
The official end of the flood was February 20th, nearly six weeks after the river began to rise. However, the residents of Evansville were not able to return to their normal lifestyles for many months. 42% of the city's area had been flooded, involving over 1,200 square blocks of Evansville. The final count of damages exceeded $30 million, which in today's terms is equivalent to $430 million. Eventually, Evansville returned to normal. The damage was repaired and houses were rebuilt, but the memory of the 1937 flood has remained. The present levy was built to prevent such a disaster from occurring again. To this day, there has never been a flood more severe than that of the flood of 1937. Now let us all remember these lessons we have learned from this great disastrous flood, give freely as we've earned, to suffering and meet life's demands as God to us has taught. Today perhaps we've bountiful, tomorrow maybe not.